So, all right, Cookdown, why it prevents you from breaking SCOM? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me say I'm Vincent de Vries from OpsLogix. Um, I'm managing partner at OpsLogix, and I'm presenting this together with uh, Michel Kamp, and he's a senior developer at OpsLogix. So let's start talking about Cookdown. Uh, sorry, uh, let me just uh, I have one more slide, uh, which I put in last minute. Uh, let me first talk about OpsLogix a little bit and uh, do a shameless plug. Uh, we were established in 2009, uh, so you know what we're coming from. Uh, we basically started with uh, add-ons and plugins for um, um, System Center, and we started doing some stuff for SCCM, but we actually did most for SCOM, so management packs. Uh, we started off with a management pack for BlackBerry and then went on to Oracle and uh, VMware and uh, did things like Swift as well. And we kind of make other uh, products for SCOM these days, which are, um, uh, which is uh, Easy Alert, um, which basically helps you manage your alert through uh, artificial intelligence. So for all this work in 2011, we became an official System Center Alliance partner, uh, which we found uh, endorsement for our work. Now, so why am I telling you this? Well, you know, I'm just um, um, showing you um, the expertise we've had over the years. So finally, on to um, uh, Cookdown. Uh, let me. Uh, show you the agenda for this session. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is a recap of MP workflows because we need to know about MP workflows before we actually start talking about Cookdown. Then what I'd like to show you is a demo and it's a demo of a disk-free management pack scenario. So this management pack looks at the free disk space in gigabytes for um, well, basically our servers and we created a uh, management pack for that, which adds on to the already existing Windows OS management pack. Then after we took a look, uh, have taken a look at that management pack, uh, we're going to look at what Cookdown is and why you should be using it. And then after that, we'll do a demo for adding Cookdown to the disk-free management pack. So then you actually have a demo of how you would do that. Um, also, uh, after that, uh, Michel, he will be showing you a real-life example of Cookdown in the OpsLogix VMware management pack, and he'll also um, put in a word why you would actually want to do that and why it would not be poss uh, possible to get these um, good, to get good performance if we didn't use it. And then we'll have our Q and A. So let's get started. Uh, let's get started on a recap of the uh, management pack workflow. Well, in the first place, uh, what we've seen here is um, that we have a data source. And the data source is actually the beginning of a workflow in Operations Manager. Now, um, just a word on the workflows in general. Uh, a workflow in general uh, would be anything having to do with a monitor, so gathering information for a monitor and then turning it to any value. And for every monitor, for every rule, there's a workflow in uh, running an operations manager on the agent. So a data source is the start of your workflow. So we see here, you can actually gather information from your disk or from memory or from a CPU uh, from the outside world. So we call the outside world from SCOM or a database or as you see here, a VM from VMware or something like that. And then you can add that to your, uh, or actually import it through your data source in Operations Manager. Now, after a data source in your workflow, uh, you get something called a condition detect. And a condition detect does a couple of things. It can actually filter the type of data um, you want uh, to have in um, your workflow. So it could be something like a threshold, um, a threshold uh, if it's above a certain value or below a certain value. And that would be for a monitor. If it's above a certain value, then you want the threshold to continue to something like a critical monitor. If you don't want it to continue, then it's below a certain value and the workflow will just be killed and nothing will happen with that particular workflow. You can also use a condition detect, for example, for a alert. So <clears throat> in a case of an alert, 
then uh, you can um, add a value as well. And if it's above a certain threshold, then an alert will be sent. If it's below a certain threshold, alert will not be sent. So that's a condition detect. Then the final step of a, a workflow on your agent is a write action. And the write action actually causes um, uh, things to be written to SCOM itself. Now there are two major write actions, which we uh, which we'll just talk about briefly. There's one write action which writes to the operational database uh, in Operations Manager. Um, basically, this is a write action which causes a monitor to change state, or an, or an alert to be sent, or a uh, point to be graphed on a performance graph in the operations console. Then we have another write action which writes to the data warehouse in uh, Operations Manager. And this write action uh, basically inserts all the data into uh, the data warehouse, which aggregates it, and then later on you can report over that data um, in the data warehouse to see basically your aggregated data or your availability or any other uh, anything else you would like to report over. Now, these are the two major write actions you have in Operations Manager, which are usually used, but you also have other write actions which can write to the outside world. Basically, you could write to a file if you really wanted to do that, or you could write to, um, you could do a REST API call uh, with a write action. But these are things which are not commonly used. So basically, these are the three building blocks of an MP workflow. There can be other modules in between. So you could have multiple condition detects if you would like to do that. Um, you could have multiple outputs uh, in your write action if you'd like to do that. You can only have one input source though um, at one point. So what would the inputs be? Well, commonly um, if you use uh, native SCOM modules, you usually have DLLs or executables which fire off those modules. Um, basically, gathering data from your Windows server would uh, commonly done, be done by a DLL, which is just a module gathering information from WMI or an executable. But if you write a custom script like we'll be doing in uh, uh, the free disk space MP, then you commonly use a script. And in our case, we'll be using a, v a PowerShell script and uh, instead of a VB script. So let me give you a demo. First of all, I want to show you a management pack, uh, the free space management pack and how we've created it and what it actually does and how it works. So I'll go over to um, my demo machine. And we'll go to the operations manager console. So this is operations manager 2016. Um, when I click here, you can see that we already imported the Microsoft Windows Server Management Pack, and this is the management pack for Windows Server 2016. Now, we're, we already have all these uh, views uh, available, so like uh, alert view and tasks. So there are many monitors already attached to this management pack, which is just authored by Microsoft itself. But what we decided to do with the disk-free um, management pack is to add a monitor which makes use of the instances which um, are targeted at the drives. So what you can see here is we have uh, C till H drive, or you know, all these drive letters, I think they're about 10 or 11, there are 11 drives around here. And we added a monitor to that. So if we open the Health Explorer for F, we can actually see that our demo free disk space monitor in gigabytes is attached to this instance. Now let's take a look at the monitor properties for the monitor we made. So when we look here, we have the description. Okay, that's all very nice, but the configuration is actually the part we're interested in. So if you look at the configuration, the interval it runs every 60 seconds. Uh, we don't have a sync time. We don't really care about that right now. Um, the drive name, which in this case is F, is a replacement variable um, with the uh, Microsoft Windows logical drive slash name property. 
And then we have a healthy threshold. So if your um, free disk space is above 10 gigabytes, then it's healthy. If it's in between 10 and four, then you get a warning. So basically the F disk has between four and 10 gigabytes free. And then if you drop below uh, four gigabytes, then you'll get a critical warning um, or your monitor will go into a critical state. So that's basically all this monitor does. Now, we have added some logging to this monitor um, just for purposes of this demo. And we also open the performance monitor. So when we look at this monitor, what we can see is that for all the 11 workflows, it will run once. So it'll start at something like 11.13 right here and all the way to the top. So we have 11 monitors selected. Now, if we take a careful look at this, each time this monitor runs, we get an enormous CPU spike to 100%. And this is probably caused by the script we're running because it's very inefficient and it's actually a very heavy performance penalty to run scripts in operations managers. So you have to make them um, you have to make them very efficient if you want to do something about that. But still, you know, sometimes even the most efficient script has quite a performance penalty attached to it. So that's that's one thing we don't really like uh, about this monitor. Let me show you the management pack, which we've authored and how this one kind of works. So basically this management pack, we've only have three items. Uh, we have a um, data source, we have the monitor type, and we have the monitor itself, which inherits from the monitor type. So let's take a look at the uh, data source first. And what we're doing actually here is we're inputting the interval seconds like you've seen. So it runs every 60 seconds. We don't do anything with the sync time, but we do input the drive name for which we want information. Now this drive name actually parses into the parameters, into the parameter block and the parameter block parses into the script we're using for, um, for collecting information about that drive and particularly the free space information which we're using. So once we have the drive name, what we can do is we can start creating a property bag. And then uh, what we do is we create a filter and we're filtering uh, all the information which we're uh, requesting from uh, WMI. So when 32 W our logical disk and we're selecting it for a particular drive. So C, D, E, uh, F, uh, et cetera. And then we're asking or we're requesting the size and free space counters for that particular instance. So once we've retrieved that, uh, what we do is we do a conversion from bytes to gigabytes. We do that here. We divide it a couple of times uh, for the disk size in GB and disk free in GB. The disk size we're actually not really using in this management pack, but we added it anyway. Um, this is the one we're really using, so the disk free in GB. And once we've retrieved that, we add it to the uh, property bag for the management pack. And we see that we have the value here. And then we do a bit of logging which you can see in the event log. So we do a cook down demo, uh, event one, two, three, four, five, and we put it into a warning and we just do a warning because it's nice and visible. And we add some uh, more stuff here. And once we've done that, we return the property back to operations manager. So that's basically what this management pack does. And then in the monitor type, what we see typically happening is that we have a monitor type, which is healthy warning critical. So it has these three possible states. The configuration is interval, second, sync time, drive name. And like we saw before in the operations manager console, uh, the healthy threshold and critical threshold. So that goes down into all the member modules. So we use a data source, which uh, I've just shown you. So that gets parsed into the script. And then we have some condition detects. So basically to see if the workflow uh, should produce a healthy state or a critical state or a warning state. So that's what these condition detections do, like I've also shown you in the PowerPoint presentation. And then all we really need to do after creating the type is create the monitor itself. So we called it free disk space in GB. 
which we've seen there uh, is targeted against an existing instance of Microsoft Windows Server uh, 10.0 and then the logical disk instance. And we have a reference here for the Microsoft Management Pack. So that's all good and well. Uh, we have to configure the monitor right here in this block. So the interval seconds is 60. So it runs every 60 sec uh, seconds or a minute. We do a replacement variable here for the logical disk name. So C uh, uh, semicolon or D and then the thresholds. So we could actually change them around here. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so this is the management pack, which basically runs here and you know, changes the state for all these monitors. And we can see that basically all these drives run here. They have less than 10 gigs free. The only drive here is C, which has probably more than that. All right. So that's our management pack. We're quite happy with it. The only thing we're really not all that happy with is the uh, performance of the management pack. So that brings us to the topic of Cookdown. Well, <clears throat> basically what I've just shown you is a management pack which does not utilize Cookdown in, uh, in Operations Manager. What happens is we have a data source and the data source contains the script and it runs for each instance separately. <clears throat> so if we have 10 or 11 instances like we've seen already in the example, then um, it'll uh, run the script each time for um, each instance, which is quite a performance penalty. <coughs> Excuse me. So it would be great if we could only run the script once for all of the workflows, because that will save us a factor 11 of, um, um, of performance, of CPU performance in, um, in our management pack. So we can actually do this. We can uh, have one data source. Um, in our management pack. And this is actually the principle of Cookdown. So Cookdown is really, you try to run uh, one data source once for multiple workflows, and which is a really great thing because if you have like a, a huge PowerShell script doing uh, very complex things to gather information out of, uh, uh, I don't know, Windows or something else, then you only have to run it once. It gathers all the information and passes it to all the workflows, all the 11 workflows in the case of this example. <clears throat> but we do have to reauthor our management pack a little bit. So what is needed for uh, the cookdown of a workflow? Well, uh, first of all, uh, all the data sources must have the same input parameters. Now, if we look at the example of um, the management pack I just showed you, well, uh, the interval seconds would be the same. <laughs> the sync time would be the same because we just don't input it. Only the drive name is a bit problematic because the drive name is always different. So for one, it's C, the other one is D, and then we have E um, all the way down to the 11th one uh, we're using. So we kind of have to reauthor this to make uh, the data source have all the same input parameters. <clears throat> and there's one more thing. Um, you know, basically when we have a data source which outputs information for all of our instances, so C, D, E, et cetera, then we also need to um, make the workflow such that it has, it knows which property bag to look at. Uh, because it's now outputting all the property bags for all the workflows we have here. <laughs> so what we kind of need to do is need to add an extra condition detect for the workflow uh, in the workflows and all the workflows. So that basically uh, the condition detect looks at uh, the instance name and says, well, if I have a property bag, which is for the C instance, then I'll pass it through my condition detect, which sets it to a healthy warning or critical state and then writes the action out to SCOM. So that's basically what we uh, want to do. Uh, that's how we want to change our management pack. So I'm going to go back to <clears throat> my demo machine and show you how you can change your management pack to do that. So we're going to go to Visual Studio. And the first thing we really have to do is we have to change our data source. 
So what I'm going to do is instead of just changing it <clears throat> right here in the data source, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm having a terrible cough. I'm going to add a new fragment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going <clears> to <throat> create a new data source in an empty fragment. And we'll call it uh, script this space cookdown DS instead of the one we had, which I showed before, which is just the scripted disk space DS. So now we have scripted disk space dot cookdown DS. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy all of this and I'm going to add it here. And we're going to change this around. Well, first of all, the offending parameter, which was always different, is the drive name. So we're going to take that out. So actually by removing this, then uh, cookdown could occur, but we still have to change the script to uh, give us information about all the drives. Also, <clears throat> what we need to do is get rid of the parameter block here because we're not using parameters in the script anymore. And also when we go to the script itself, then we see here we have a parameter block here for the drive name. Well, we want to gather information on all the drives, so we're just going to delete this. We still have to create a new property bag. So the O API, new object, com object, mom scripting API. <clears throat> we can get rid of the filter because we're not going to filter a name because again, we're just going to loop through all the drives. So we can remove the filter here as well because we're going to gather information on all the disks. But what we do want to add to the property bag is the name uh, of the instance. So we're going to request that too from WMI on the Win32 logical disk object. So we also do still want to uh, convert all the uh, information into gigabytes. We want to return the property bags. But now instead of um, uh, we still want to add an extra value to our property bag, which is the drive name. And we're just going to get that from the um, objects we collect here. Now, one other thing we have to do is we have to loop through all the drives. So basically, we're going to collect disks here instead of one disk. And what we're going to do here is do for each loop. And in the for each loop, we're going to go through every disk in uh, every disk in disks. So what we'll do is add a bracket here. We'll just make this a little bit prettier by adding a tab. So that's pretty cool. So for every disk right now, uh, we're going to calculate the size in GB. We're going to create a property bag, and we're going to insert these values. The one thing we do have to do is we have to go here and we have to output the property bag. So we see that we have a property bag here. And I also want to add some logging information to just show you that basically it's being cooked down later on in the event log. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, every time it loops through, I'm going to add the drive to a variable. And then basically in the same event, which will write to the operations manager event log. We'll output it here in event one, two, three, four, five. It's still a warning event, um, getting values for drives, and then all the drives we're actually looping through. So I think that kind of uh, is enough for this module right here. So we'll save that. So let's see what we have to change in our monitor type. Well, in our monitor type, we have quite a few things already written here. Uh, let's see, we have the configuration, the interval second sync time, drive name. We'll keep the drive name in the monitor type because we need to put input that in our condition detection module, which we still have to add. Um, we have a healthy critical threshold. We'll keep these. We have some overridable parameters. And then we use a data source in our... Uh, um, in our monitor type, and we need to start using the cookdown data source, which we just created. 
so out of that, so now it's making use of the cookdown data source, but the cookdown data source uh, does not use the drive name anymore, so we need to remove that from here. It'll still be used in a condition detect, which we're going to add just now. And basically, right here, we need to add a uh, another condition detect because these are only the condition detects what state to turn the monitor into. So we'll just make a space here for that. And I already created a condition detection, which is for cookdown. So what we have here, as you can see, we have a cookdown filter. And the cookdown filter, what it does, it takes the input parameter from the configuration, which we have up here, so the drive name, um, which is basically inputted from the replacement variable in the monitor itself. So it inputs C, D, E, or F drive or something like that. And then we'll check here in the property bag itself to see if the property drive name is actually equal to that particular uh, drive name instance. So that's what we have here. And then if it's the correct drive name uh, drive name we have here, then the workflow will continue onto the other condition detections. One thing we do have to do in this monitor type is tell it that it also has to use that condition detection. Well, I've already kind of created that block for you. Um, hold on. So which is regular detections. And what you can see here is that we now have the cookdown filter in between every node. So first it runs the data source, so it collects all the information. Then we have the cookdown filter running. If it's the correct instance, then it will be passed on to the healthy expression. Um, we have the same here. First it goes to the data source cookdown filter, or it passes the critical expression or the warning expression. So we're pretty much done here. Uh, let's take a look at the monitor if we need to change anything there. Well, it's still um, the same monitor. It, you still use the same monitor type. It's still targeted at the instance um, from the Windows Server Management Pack. Uh, what we're looking at here is the configuration. Well, the interval is still 60 seconds, so that's fine. The sync time is still nothing. The drive name is still the replacement parameter, but it's no longer going into the data source, so that's good. It's only going into the condition detect. And then we have a healthy threshold of 10 gigs and a critical threshold of four, which we're going to keep the same. So we really don't have to change anything for this monitor. Um, so we can just go ahead and uh, fingers crossed, let's build this management pack and see what it does. Okay, so line 29, cut on script, disk space, DS. One thing I forgot to do is change the name of this data source, which is supposed to be Cookdown, Cookdown DS. Otherwise, we'll have a duplicate name because that was already used. And let's build the solution again. OK, so success. Build, one succeeded, zero failed, very good. So what I'll do right now is I'll press F5. And basically, there's a in uh, Visual Studio, if you press F5, you can import it into your SCOM installation directly. And let's just wait until it's done that. So let me just quickly talk about what we are expecting to see right now. If we go back to our event log and our performance monitor, what I'd expect to see really is after it imports the management pack is I would no longer want to see 11 events for collecting data, but I'd only want to see one. And in the performance monitor itself, I would expect to stop seeing these big spikes going to 100% CPU. So it's importing the management pack. Let's see, it already got a new configuration, so it'll take about a minute for it to run that um, uh, monitor again or run all the monitors for all the drives again. Yeah. 
So let's wait for that. And at the time when the uh, event is produced, we can correlate that to basically uh, the performance monitor and see what kind of CPU readout we get. Oh, F5 it a few times. There we go. So this one is run at 11.33.16. So we have 11.33.13. So maybe here. So what we get here is we see a far better performance footprint of uh, our monitor itself. And also, it only runs once. And it shows that we're actually getting um, the values for all the disks, C, D, E, all, all the way till M. So that's nice. Uh, now we've actually created a cookdown version of our monitor. And if you look at our monitor itself, nothing has changed uh, on the surface because it still does the same. It still monitors for the same disk space in, in gigabytes. So that's it for the uh, demo management pack, really. Um, going back here, we, I'd like to go down or basically um, go to the cookdown of the OpsLogix VMware management pack. And basically, this principle I've just shown you, we use uh, very frequently in the VMware MP because there you have to do, deal with like thousands of VMs and a lot of ESX hosts. Um, but I'll leave, uh, I'll pass the ball to Michel Kamp and he will tell us more about the OpsLogix VMware management pack. Okay, great. Thank you, Vince. Uh, can you make me presenter? Uh, yeah, hold on. There you go. <laughs> so, Let's have a look how we at AppLogic implement the cookdown in our management packs. First, I want to start providing some insights on the VMware management pack. See this diagram for the relationships between the VM class targets and the monitors and rule workflows assigned to it. You see these are a lot of workflows that are targeted against the VMs. If you don't apply cookdown, SCUM will have to execute too many operations and will get fully utilized, resulting in the known breakdown. So how did we manage this? Let's have a look at this workflow diagram. We see four workflows, two rules and two monitors that are targeted at the same VM class instances. In this example, we have four VM class instances in real life scenarios, you will have thousands of VMs in big environments. We take, for example, the monitor workflow that gets the CPU utilization of the VM and gets unhealthy when the threshold is hit. Let's follow this workflow, starting from off the data source view. It all starts with the data source that is triggered every 300 seconds to call a probe. This probe gets all performance data from all VMs using the VMware MOB. The return data is converted to property back data and only the property back of the requested VM is returned. In the next data source, we filter out the requested performance counter property back. This property back is sent to a monitor module that checks the thresholds for this monitor instance. If any threshold is hit, data is sent to the monitor to get processed. The hill state of the targeted VM class will be updated. By assuring that the schedule interval for all workflows is the same, so 300 seconds, and the configuration passed to the probe is the same, we are sure this probe is only called one time instead of four times. So now demo time. Let me go to my demo server. I 
I have installed the Opsologic VMware Management Pack and configured one virtual center with eight hosts and in this case, 16 virtual machines. The virtual machine class has a couple of monitor attached. Let me show you. Also, it has a couple of performance counters connected. They're all zero. And every performance counter has the same interval. And that's, again, very important. So every time we trigger the probe to get the firmware data, we put event 13 into our event log. So let's check by using a PowerShell script This script gets all the events with ID 13. Let me execute this one. Over the past period. So there it is. So looking at the results and looking at the time generated column, we see that it is only generated every five minutes to get all the data from all the 16 virtual machines and it will distribute through all the above attached monitors that use the same data source in this case. So let me switch back to the presentation again. So let us have a look at the footprint improvements we will get by using Cookdown. Uh, we managed to get a stable monitoring of 350 hosts, 3,000 VMs using one single, all-in-one box SCUM server. So looking at these numbers, you see that Cookdown is worth implementing when you have large numbers of targets to monitor. So that will conclude my end my demo. Vince, I leave the closing for you. Yeah, one thing, uh, Michel, uh, how many... Uh, how many hosts and how many VMs would you be able to monitor if you did not use Cookdown? So I think from a non-Cookdown scenario, it would be uh, 800 VMs. So that will be a factor of four, I think. And about 100 hosts, that will be a factor three. So it really does, does make a huge difference. Yeah, especially when you have a lot of uh, targets to monitor. Okay, well, that's really good. Um, well, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Michelle, for that. Uh, let me go back to my screen. I think everybody can see that again. And if you would mute yourself again, Michelle. Um, so basically, all that is really left uh, on this session. Uh, you know, we've tried to show you in a very short period of time what the Cookdown technology is in um, uh, in uh, Operations Manager. Um, um, you know, I hope you got a glimpse of it. Um, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask. And I think I see some already. Uh, one moment. We have questions here, I think. Um, Let me see if I can expand that. Uh, Vincent, if you undock that uh, Q and A window, that uh, gives you uh, more more real screen real estate to look at the questions that are being asked. Ah. So I think there's about four questions that are waiting for you. Okay, great. Let's see. Hi. Uh, let's see how much data and number of SCOM items can we? Um, okay, so uh, here's a question. How much data, number of SCOM data items can we cook down? Um, well, it really uh, is, um, it's, it's really up to, um, 
you can you can do it infinitely really i mean if you can use one data source then you can uh, hook it up to as many workflows as you like so if you have um, if you're collecting data for about i don't know a thousand vms or something and um, you can distribute that data to a thousand workflows then um, you have it cooked down that way so i hope that answer your your question but really um yeah it's it's infinite really and after a while you start running out of resources anyway so uh, i will guess that is the limitation uh is it possible to write the file system size in the performance data in the same mp uh yes you can make use of the same data source actually between monitors and uh, rules so what you can do is you can use the same data source to populate your performance data um, as uh, to actually do alerting so that is technically a, a little bit more difficult but uh, it can be done and uh, i'm not sure if michelle did you ever write a blog about that or something uh no oh okay well maybe it'd be a, it, it would make a nice blog how to do that <laughs> All right. Um, I hope that asked to, uh, answers your question, Klaus. Um, then we have a question from Peter West. Um, could you mute yourself again, uh, Michelle? It's quite a, it's a bit rowdy. Thanks. Um, is Cookdown predominantly needed for script-based workflows uh, you create yourself? Uh, is it less of a consideration when using built-in monitor types such as? Um, Ping, mon uh, ping monitor types. I asked because I've created an MP that discovers 10 to 20 instances of the class, which then have monitors using the above type. Um, it really is up to the existing monitor already if it makes use of Cookdown. So if you start to author your own management packs, uh, if you start creating your own um, um, workflows in, in your management pack, so in, uh, in your monitoring, you start using your own data source. If you start using that from scratch, you really have to start thinking about uh, if you're making use of Cookdown. If you're using templates um, for monitors, then usually if they're created correctly, um, you know, you can, uh, they, they usually make use of Cookdown already. So uh, I'm not sure about the monitor.systemcenter.ping monitor type um, I guess uh, I haven't seen this one but the ping monitor type I guess it would have been um, I'm not sure if it would be because it'd be hard to collect information about all the different ping um, targets in one go but um, in general um, if there's a monitor type um, and if it's well written then it should already make use of that uh, technology of Cookdown. Uh, let's see. So then, uh, let's see. If you change the interval of a sync time on the monitor, this will have a dramatic effect on your environment if a single Cookdown is used in your example. Yes, uh, that is correct. Uh, if you um, change something in an override parameter, that can definitely break Cookdown, especially for that. Uh, if you do it for one instance. So you have to take that into account. So Vince, uh, <coughs> I want some addition on this question. I yeah. forgot to mention, you have to be sure your sync time is uh, set to zero, 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 just to have uh, your, uh, your scheduler executed every um, five minutes, exactly five minutes. That's very important. If you don't specify your sync time, mm -hmm. then what will happen, every monitor will start up with a little different uh, 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 start time. So that will definitely break your cookdown. Okay, so in the example I, I gave, actually, I forgot to add uh, the sync time, so that should have been there. Yeah, if you uh, have small sets, you don't will have this problem. If you have many targets, you will have that problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you use any workaround for property bag size limits querying 3,000 VMs? Um, yeah, you can use uh, other techniques. You can use batching for that. Uh, maybe, Michelle, you would like to uh, uh, elaborate on that? I'm not sure if we, um, uh, we're running out of time, I think, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. I, I, 
it will also um, give you a little bit more um, answer to how much data your uh, property bags can be cooked down. First question. Um, if you send uh, all the property bags in one shot back to SCUM, it will definitely, if you have uh, thousands of property bags to send back, it will definitely kill the host process from your agent because he has to process it all at once. And there are some techniques you can use when you use your own uh, modules you read, you have written to get uh, to page your data sets and just send them to SCOM in, in nicely paged, uh, maybe 300 property bags each time till you're finished. So if you use that uh, technique, you will assure you will leave some uh, um, processing time for the agent to process it to, uh, before he gets his next uh, uh, property back uh, batch. So that will solve the problem of paging, but that can only be done in, of course, you, you can do also do it in your PowerShell script, and uh, you can also do it in uh, your own uh, C-sharp written modules. Okay, so there's one more question remaining. Uh, that is from, uh, from Constantin. Um, SCOM cannot send too much data and that is 5,120 data items between any modules without data loss. So Cookdown works for very limited solutions in case of huge monitor data. Would you care to comment on that, Michel? It's a bit strange. I can't see the questions here. So let me see if... <clears throat> Can you repeat it again, Vince? Because, oh, there, there it is. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know how this. Um, so maybe you could, um, would it be possible to give a few more comments about this one? Uh, otherwise, we can take it offline. Um, so <clears throat> the best way is also to cook down your management package to be sure you are using. Um, um, shared data sources, uh, so you have uh, less uh, workflows uh, to go through. Normally, an agent uh, can handle about 70k of workflows uh, before it is getting in trouble. So that's also uh, a way how to uh, assure that uh, you can pass more um, uh, workflows. So. I'm not sure this answers your question, otherwise we can take it offline. Okay, I think that kind of concludes everything. Um, well, thanks uh, for answering that, Michelle, and uh, a very big thank you to Harold uh, for inviting us to have a session uh, on this webcast, and I think uh, we'll go back to you.